Good morning, everyone. It's great to see uh, such a nice crowd here on Sunday morning. I'm Linda Lunnan Blanton. I'm uh, Institutional Director of English at Anatolia, one of the co sponsors of, um, of this conference and of this particular plenary speaker. Uh, one thing, uh, just to share this with you, International TESOL is being held right now this weekend in New Orleans, Louisiana, USA, my hometown. And I am very privileged uh, and honored to be here with you this weekend at the 18th uh, TESOL Macedonia Thrace Convention. A couple of housekeeping details at the registration desk there is a folder, uh, a notebook, in which uh, the TESOL board solicits your comments, uh, your reaction, your feedback uh, to this convention. And we would, def would certainly please drop by the, the registration desk to tell us what you think of the conference and to offer suggestions for improvement or to tell us uh, what, what you've liked. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Sirachi will be speaking tomorrow night up the hill at Anatolia on the high school campus. So um, either you know this already or maybe after her plenary today, you will think that you want to, you want to share what she has to say with family and co colleagues so please, uh, all of you are welcome. Everyone is welcome. This is open to the public. 7.30 tomorrow evening on the Anatolia High School campus. So uh, please join us there, Raphael Hall. Uh, what I don't know about Dr. Sirachi is whether or not she smoked a joint in the, <laughs> in the restroom at Buck Buckingham Palace. That's an inside joke. Uh, if you were here yesterday, you know what I'm talking about. Not that she's willing to admit to. Uh, what I do know about Dr. Sirachi is that she received her undergraduate degree from the University of Rome, her master's degree from the University of Southern California, and her PhD from the University of Edinburgh, where she is now professor of developmental linguistics and she also currently holds a part-time visiting professorship at the University of Tromsø in Norway. Uh, she is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and a fellow of the Royal Society of the Encouragement of Arts, Manufactures, and Commerce. From 2005 to 2007, she was the holder of a British Academy research readership. In her career, and she's still going strong, she has held research appointments and visiting professorships at various institutions, including the Max Planck Institute uh, of Psycholinguistics, John Hopkins University and Michigan State University in the US, the University of Hamburg, and the University of Siena. Her research focuses on a number of interrelated questions that bring together linguistics, experimental psychology, and cognitive science. And her research achievements span different subfields of scientific inquiry. She's a leading authority in the field of bilingual language development, where she is particularly well known in four areas. One, for her studies of exceptionally talented adult second language speakers, of which I must admit I am not one. Secondly, for her research on the changes that take place uh, in the native languages of advanced second language speakers. Three, for her investigation of bilingual language acquisition in early and late childhood and four of the effects of bilingualism in non-linguistic domains. She is also internationally known for her contribution to theoretical language typology, 
especially for her research on constrained variation at the interface of lexicon and syntax, which she has investigated in many languages, and also known for her studies of gradients in natural language. Moreover, she has contributed significantly to experimental methods in linguistics by pioneering the use of magnitude estimation as a technique for the elicitation of linguistic acceptability judgments. She's committed to disseminating the findings of research on bilingualism outside academia, and to that effort, to that end, she's the founder of the Information and Consultancy Service Bilingualism Matters, and was recently awarded a Beltane Fellowship for Public Engagement. And her work is particularly important for all, all of us in this room, engaged in English language teaching, and uh, so much of what she has to, to share with us is of special importance for us as we educate parents uh, as to the tremendous importance of their children developing a second language. And to, uh, to, to educate them in terms of a wider understanding of, of, of its value and its implications, not necessarily for collecting diplomas and certificates, and not necessarily for um, passing exams, but in terms of their lifelong benefits, of which Dr. Sirace will speak today. Thank you very much for being here. Now to you. And thank you to Tiesel Macedonia Thresh for inviting me. Uh, thanks to Anatolia College for sponsoring me and for giving me the opportunity to be back in Thessaloniki. I'm always happy when I come back here. So I'm not a language teacher. I'm a researcher. Uh, in Edinburgh, we work on bilingualism at all ages, as, uh, as Linda said. So we study the whole lot, from, from children who uh, acquire two languages from birth, to children who learn one language first and then another, to adults who learn a foreign language later on in life. And we are interested in looking at age effects and, and the effects of general cognition on bilingualism, but also the effects of bilingualism, so having two languages in the same brain, on general cognition. So I'm going to talk about research mostly today, although at the end I'm going to say something about how important it is for, for everybody to know about the results of research. Um, so uh, the point that I'm going to make is that being bilingual opens doors to cognitive enhancement. And that's my little tribute to Jim Morrison and Light My Fire and The Doors, like uh, other presenters. I felt I had to do that. Um, so why is bilingualism good for you? I'm aware that I'm, uh, I'm preaching to the converted here, because of course you know that bilingualism is good for you, uh, but many people don't. Um, let me tell you, first of all, that I'm using the term bilingual in a broad sense. So, uh, not in a, in, a, in a technical sense, like bilingual from birth, uh, and many researchers in the past used this term to refer to bilinguals from birth. I'm using it in a broader sense to refer to anyone who's fluent in more than one language and uses mo both languages on a regular basis. Um, and the point I'm going to, I hope I'm going to show you that knowing more than one language actually changes the brain in a very significant way. And so learning languages is really an investment for the future. It's an investment for lifetime. It's an investment on better brains. Now, we all know that bilingualism is very common in the world. It's the norm, in fact, in many places in the world. But in Europe, it's still relatively unusual. So Europe, I tend to think of Europe as a collection of monolingual countries. Um, 
a collection of monolingual countries that are dealing with increasing international mobility, increasing patterns of immigration, um, and so to any, uh, with an increase of the number of bilingual and multilingual families and the number of bilingual and multilingual speakers. So just in case you think that Scotland is a monolingual country, well, a recent survey found out that there are at least 160 languages spoken in Scottish schools. So that's quite a lot of languages. It's a lot of ling linguistic diversity in Scotland alone. So there is a growing need for information about how bilingualism works at different ages. Um, again, I'm preaching to the converted. You may not share these myths, these misconceptions about child bilingualism. But I can tell you they're very widespread indeed because I deal with parents, I deal with teachers in the UK and elsewhere and I've become aware of how uh, deeply rooted these misconceptions are. For example, the idea that having two languages in a young child, in a baby, can cause delays in other areas of cognitive development. Um, and this seems to be uh, the idea connected to, uh, uh, to a, 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 the brain, thinking of the brain as a box with a finite number of compartments. So if you have two languages there, you're necessarily taking space away for other things. We know that the brain doesn't work that way at all, so uh, research has shown that this myth is ill-founded. What about the idea that bilingualism leads to language confusion in a small child? I hear this all the time, parents who tell me, wouldn't it be better if I wait until the first language is established before I introduce another one uh, or before I expose my child to another language? Well, I'm going to show you later that there is no evidence whatsoever that bilingualism leads to confusion and in fact, research points in the opposite direction. So, we're going to cross this out too. Um, what about this other misconception of a different nature uh, that says, well, bilingualism is useful, yeah, maybe, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of an effort, it's a, bit, a little bit of an imposition on a child, but if it's worth it if both languages are useful. And by useful, people mean widely spoken. So English, of course, uh, more, many people talk about Chinese more and more, but certainly French, certainly German, you know, languages, Spanish, languages that have white currency. Um, I'm going to show you later that it doesn't matter which languages a bilingual has. Any two or three languages do the trick. So any two or three languages actually give people uh, advantages. So there are absolutely no foundations to these ideas, we'll see why, um, because as I said, bilingualism in any languages gives children not only linguistic benefits, but also some non-linguistic benefits, non-linguistic advantages that actually uh, <clears throat> improve the way children think, the way children act in everyday life, in whatever they're doing. And these, uh, we'll see that these advantages are not just found in children, they're found in adults who've grown up with two languages and who've been using them on a regular basis. So really an investment for life that bilingualism um, seems to be. How does the child's brain work? Well, we all know that learning things when you're younger seems to be easier. So children tend to acquire things, many, many different kinds of skills, um, seemingly